Okay, with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. I've known Ron White for several years now. In my past life, as director of the George W. Bush Library and Museum, I met Ron not long after I arrived in Dallas. I think maybe the first or second night I was there where he had been meeting with President Bush, who was and is a great admirer of Ron's work. I've remained a big fan of Ron since then. I'm so delighted and honored that he came to speak with us here tonight. Ron is a graduate of UCLA and Princeton Theological Seminary. He's taught at many institutions around the nation and is a fellow at the Huntington Library in California, which is a great place if you haven't been, you should go, and at the Trinity Forum in DC. I think Ron's single volume of Abraham Lincoln is one of the best books I've ever read. I highly recommend that. His book, The Eloquent President, same thing. And I've noted this to Ron. I have a special affection for his book about Lincoln in the second inaugural uh, called Lincoln's Greatest Speech. It is a beautifully written extremely moving book and again could not recommend it enough so I was uh, such a fan of Ron I was so excited to hear about his book on Grant American Ulysses a life of Ulysses S. Grant you know President Grant I think was a truly great and good man and with Ron helping lead the way I think our nation is coming to a much better understanding of who Grant was and why we owe him an incredible debt of gratitude and as we prepare to enter the celebration of the Illinois Bicentennial next year we should be proud I think as Illinoisans that Illinois had a role in creating uh, the man that, that Grant became. Uh, I will note that though we haven't officially announced this yet, our plan is next year, as part of that bicentennial, to host a special exhibit in the museum uh, looking at those four presidents who have deep Illinois roots. Lincoln, of course, uh, President Reagan, Obama, and of course, Ulysses Grant. I'm very excited about that exhibit and the opportunity, as part of that exhibit, to put more, even more emphasis on the role that Grant took in preserving and leading this nation. So again, I want to thank you all for being here, um, and please welcome Ron White. Coming here once again is a great privilege and joy, seeing people I've known before. I entered into the study of Lincoln in the latter chapter of my life. I think we all have chapters. And I remember I arrived the first day, and I think they were checking me out to see if I really knew what I was doing, if I had any real knowledge of Lincoln. So this place I've come to again and again and again and again for research and to speak. I was thinking the last time I was here after this sort of an event in the evening, the next morning, the bookstore had me signing my books. and. As I was doing so, a group of young girls came in. I think they were from a Lutheran school in Southern Illinois dressed in their uniforms. And this one girl, she must have been 12 or 13, she really wanted to buy my paperback version of the grant of Lincoln biography. So she asked the salesperson, how much is this? And he said, $20. And she looked in her purse and she had $20. But he said, it's actually $21.92 with tax and her face Bell. I reached into my wallet, took out two dollars. I said, "Boy, any young girl that wants to buy a book like that at twelve or thirteen, hey, <laughs> was great." Well, people have asked me, uh, and I've asked myself, why did I decide to write a book on Ulysses S. Grant after writing three books on Abraham Lincoln? And I think for the very same reason, these two figures. Here are two remarkable individuals who I believe become great American leaders, but who make mistakes in their lives, who, but who learn from their mistakes. But to me, the most enduring quality of each of them, and this is why I often call Grant now a new vision of American leadership, each of them triumphed not for themselves, but their goal was something beyond themselves. They pointed beyond themselves to this American democracy. And I think that's what makes them so remarkable. I find the humility of Grant, the self-effacement of Grant, quite remarkable. We're starting this evening with this medallion. This is from the 1870s. It is a depiction of how people in the 1870s would have thought of the three great Americans. George Washington, for sure, father. Abraham Lincoln, it's early after his death, martyr. Ulysses S. Grant, Defender. In May, I was in Philadelphia, and uh, the curator of the uh, Union League Club showed me, and I'll make it part of my presentation in the future, yet another medallion, the same three figures, Washington, 
Lincoln and Grant. In the year 1900, Theodore Roosevelt was asked the question, who do you think are the greatest living Americans? And this was his answer. Mightiest among the mighty, got that? Great, thank you. <laughs> Mightiest among the mighty living dead are George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant. But Roosevelt went on to say, he went on to say of second rank, of second rank are Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and Andrew Jackson of second rank. Well, we may want to talk a little bit, and you may want to ask the question a little bit more in the comments and questions. What happened? How did Grant fall? I believe that now in the 21st century, it's time for an upgrade for Grant. He needs to rise. I was privileged for the first time to participate in the C-SPAN presidential survey of American presidents. They did one in 2000, 2007, and 2017. In each of those three surveys, Grant is rising through the ranks of American presidents, as he should. There were 10 categories by which you would rank an American president. I'm trying to think of the exact wording, but let's say it was a ranking of social justice. In that ranking, Grant was number 10. I would have ranked him number four or five. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes, his defense of the right of the freedmen to vote in the voter suppression of his particular era. When someone writes a biography, uh, the enduring question is, well, how would you begin? And uh, my style of writing a biography is what I call from the inside out. It's interesting and important to know what a person did. Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Ulysses S. Grant led the Union Army to victory in the Civil War. I guess I'm more interested in who a person is. I think especially today the whole issue of character is so paramount. And that's what draws me to Lincoln and Grant, and I think it draws readers to Lincoln and Grant. So how to introduce this person? When I talked about Abraham Lincoln, I could presume that the audience knew a great deal. That's for sure. I will speak on Saturday morning at the Ulysses S. Grant historic site outside of St. Louis, and my friends there tell me that of those who visit that wonderful par site, it's the National Park Service, they say uh, probably at least 60% of the people who stop know almost nothing about Grant. Or they think he's the butcher, or they think he's the drunk. They don't really know very much. So how to introduce this person? If I may, the man of middle height, accompanied by a young boy, arrived at the crowded Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Station in Washington on a cold, crisp morning. It was March 8, 1864. He hailed a carriage and asked the driver to take them to Willard's Hotel. At the northwest corner of Pennsylvania Avenue and 14th Street, only two blocks from the White House, the man and boy stepped from the carriage and walked directly to the front desk. The man, 42 years old and wearing a travel-stained duster, asked for a room. The clerk sniffed brusquely. Did not the visitor know that in wartime Washington, few rooms were available, especially at Willard's, the finest hotel in the nation's capital? The clerk dallied, then informed the travelers he could give them a small room on the top floor. That would be fine, the man said softly. The clerk asked the guest to sign the register. <laughs> you know what's coming. <laughs> when the clerk turned the register around and read the signature, U.S. Grant and Son, Galena, Illinois, he turned pale. He gasped, General Grant, why didn't you tell me who you were? Peering more closely, the clerk could now see that underneath the duster, mostly hidden, was the blue uniform of a Union officer. Grant typically wore a private's uniform, almost never a general's uniform. The only way that you knew he was a general were the stars on his shoulders. The clerk had seen posters portraying the hero of the West everywhere in Washington. Suddenly attentive, he blurted out that he was reassigning Grant and his son to Parlor Suite 6. Indeed, the best in the hotel, the same suite that Abraham and Mary Lincoln had stayed in three years earlier when they arrived in Washington. 
Now that he knew who was standing in front of him, the clerk handed Grant a sealed envelope. The general opened it, finding an invitation to attend a reception at the White House that evening as the guest of honor. Because he had not served in the Eastern Theater of the Civil War, a curiosity about Grant punctuated conversations everywhere. Many knew the outline of his rise to fame, but still they wondered out loud, who was he? How had he succeeded when so many Union generals had failed over the past three years? Why had President Lincoln elevated him to the position of Lieutenant General, the first man since Washington to hold that rank? Why had Lincoln tapped him to come from the Western Theater to lead all the Union armies? But when I started into my work on this biography, I thought, well, I know quite a bit about Grant. He's obviously in my Lincoln biography. I mean, I think the relationship between Lincoln and Grant is kind of a relationship of mutual admiration. But after about a year or a year and a half into the project, I had to make a personal confession. I didn't really know the man. I did not really know this man. And I think most Americans did not either. So I confronted what I call a puzzle of many pieces. Uh, the first part of the puzzle was how to deal with the young Ulysses S. Grant. Publishers are rushing biographies into print today. It's a very popular genre. But my reading of many of these biographies is that they skip very, very quickly over the years of the young person to the one who becomes the general, the president, the inventor, whoever it is. When I showed the first chapters to some of my early readers, they even ch challenged me, do you think you can hold your audience's interest to talk about Ulysses S. Grant at 8 or 12 or 14 or 17? I spent a week at West Point. I was convinced that we had passed over that story too quickly. Grant enters West Point at age 17. He's 5 feet 1 inches tall. He's 115 pounds. He barely makes the height requirement. But Grant was, his, was the best person about why I should do this. Grant said, the reason that I do not read biographies is that they do not tell about the formative period of <laughs> one's life, about the boy who becomes the man. Think of your own lives when you were 16, 18, 20, 22. Is this not the formative period of your life? Well, surely you didn't understand everything then, but this is so important. So first of all, I wanted to tell the story of this formative period. Part of biography is irony and paradox. I've, I've learned that from reading David McCullough, who's wonderful at this and pointing this out in both Adams and Truman. And there's an irony in Grant's story. He grows up in Georgetown in uh, the southern, western part of Ohio. It's really the frontier. He does all the things that boys would do in that era. Uh, running, jumping, swimming, ice skating, horseback riding, of which he's a master, except one, except one. He would not fire a gun to kill an animal, the Civil War warrior. He would not fire a gun. It reminded me of the story of Abraham Lincoln. You know that story where his father is away. It's in Indiana, and he sees the, the, the geese flying overhead, he asks his mother if he can borrow his father's rifle, and he takes that rifle out and fires that rifle and brings a goose down. And when he gets to that point, he turns and says to his mother, I will never, ever do this again. Even though this is simply getting food, he said, I cannot do it. Second part of the puzzle was Julia. I'm convinced that women have been minimalized and marginalized as we've told the story of our American heroes. And I think this has been true of Julia. Julia Dent was the sister of Grant's roommate. Grant graduated from West Point in 1843, just 21 years of age, and was posted to Jefferson Barracks, just south of St. Louis, the largest army barracks at that time in the United States because this is where people gathered to move west to protect the settlers. His roommate told him that the Dent family was very hospitable to young soldiers, and so he went to visit them. Julia was actually in the city of St. Louis that winter. She wasn't there, but her two younger sisters, they just fell in love with Grant. And when Julia finally came home in February, she fell in love with him and he with her. So her story, I think, is really important. And 
thanks to her, she kept all of Grant's letters. We'll say a bit more down the road here, but I think I've come to believe that Grant was an introvert and she was an extrovert. And in his letters to her, he shares his feelings in a way that he doesn't with anyone else. Well, early in the project, I, I live in Southern California, and one of my good friends is a Hollywood director and writer. And I was just talking with him about this, and he said to me, oh, he said, this might make a great television miniseries. My ears <laughs> perked up. <laughs> So he said, he said, let's get together, have lunch, and I want you to think about what you think are some of the major characteristics of Grant that might do a six-hour miniseries. So early on in the conversation, telling him about the boyhood, I turned to Julia. And I said, you know, I said, I think Ulysses and Julia had one of the most remarkable marriages in American history. I mean, at the end of their lives, almost in the White House, People would come upon them, and they were holding hands like shy lovers. And as I began to tell this story, and I was kind of exuberant about it, my friend's face began to fall and frown. He said, that will never do. <laughs> he said, that will never do in a television miniseries. And I said, what? Oh, he said, television miniseries are all based on internal tension. I'd never heard that phrase before. <laughs> internal tension. So I sent him a couple of months later, the early chapters, the courting of Ulysses and Julia, their marriage, and he writes back and says, well, there is internal tension, and he was right. Ulysses was born into a strongly anti-slavery family in Ohio. Julia's father owned 30 slaves. Ju Ulysses' parents refused to come to the wedding of a son marrying into a slave-holding family. Julia's father, old Frederick Dent, gave her four slaves as a wedding gift. Young people think at 20 or 22 or 24 that they're just the two of them, but he didn't fully realize that he was marrying into this family of a father-in-law who was not at all excited that his daughter, his oldest daughter, was marrying a kind of vagabond soldier. And old Mr. Dent, who was strongly pro-slavery, this would become a difficult part of his relationship. At the end of the story, Old man Dent lives in the White House, and he's terribly, terribly proud of his son-in-law. The third part of the story, and I think this is again a mark of what it means for leadership or character, is I think Lincoln and Grant both learned from their mistakes. They made mistakes. I have to be very careful when I speak about Lincoln or speak about Grant. I'm, I'm pretty excited about them, but we cannot mask the fact that as both as young men, I mean, Lincoln's humor could hurt as a young man. His sat satire could bite people. It did, you know, you know some of these stories. And the same with Grant, and so he struggled. He, he went and participated in the war with Mexico. He was in some ways disappointed when General Zachary Taylor appointed him a quartermaster. He wanted to be in the, the fighting. It came to be that later on he was grateful for that position because he would be in charge of how do you, how do you supply an army of over 100,000 men, several hundred thousand. He returns, he marries Julia, he is posted to New York and Michigan, and then he's posted to the Pacific Coast, and Julia cannot follow him because she's pregnant with their child. And there I, I, I think of Grant as a late bloomer, and his late leadership starts to come to the fore when he leads people across the Isthmus of Panama, and they die in hours from cholera. He's first posted at Fort Vancouver by Portland, and then uh, Fort Humboldt in Northern California, and he falls into loneliness and despair and drinking. It's not quite sure exactly how this all came to be, but on the very day, literally, that the Secretary of War, irony of irony, Jefferson Davis, sends a letter to Grant telling him he's now been appointed a captain. Jefferson Davis receives a letter from Grant telling him that he's resigned from the military. And so he comes home. He wants to be with Julia. And on the way home, he gets to New York and he has no more money. And so his West Point classmate, Simone Bolivar Buckner, says, I'll stand for you. I'll take care of the hotel bill. I'll do this, you're my friend. So he gets back and has to live under the shadow of old man Dent, a difficult relationship. He finally builds this place that he calls sardonically hardscrabble, 
It's now part of the Anheuser-Busch Park, just right across the street from the Grand Historic Site. One of the great privileges of being a, a biographer is research, and one of the great stories happened right here in Springfield. I can remember the day I was working here, and I came across this document, which I think says everything, that Grant had now sunk very low in terms of his own financial status, his own sense of his own identity as the provider for the family. And on December 23rd, 1857, he walks into St. Louis and he pawns his most precious possession, a gold watch that he will be able to buy Julia a Christmas present for the next day or two. This says it all about how low Grant had become. He then, in, in really quite humiliating fashion, accepts an offer from his father to come from St. Louis to Galena, Illinois, and to participate in the family leather goods store, but underneath, underneath his younger brother. And it's there that the Civil War breaks out. Grant is the only West Point graduate in Galena, and what begins is his meteoric rise. I had the privilege of speaking on Tuesday evening at Cape Girardeau in southeastern Missouri. And this is where Grant first begins to have a command and first begins with some mistakes to learn how to go forward. And this late bloomer begins to rise in a meteoric rise so that we know Grant as the great Civil War general. I love this iconic photograph of him. This is who he is. A couple of other aspects of the puzzle that tantalized me. Uh, one is uh, the most difficult one, perhaps, is how do we understand that Grant, who had was seen such a good judge of character in his military officers, seemed not to be such a good judge of character in his presidential administration? I struggled with this. I tried to find contemporary voices. How, do, how did people understand this? What was going on or not going on? And then one other dimension I might mention is uh, I have found myself very much struck by the faith stories of American heroes and figures and have been perplexed at how these faith stories have often been, again, minimalized or marginalized, almost absent from many of the modern biographies. I think there's a profound faith story in Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Tom Schwartz, who first welcomed me to the Abraham Lincoln Library here in a, in a different uh, oration, told me early on, I'd never forgot it. I said, well, Lincoln didn't join a church. He said, Lincoln wasn't a joiner. He was not a joiner. He spoke at all the temperance societies. He never joined a temperance society. So he said, don't make too much of the fact that Lincoln did not join a church. He was not a joiner. That was his whole personality. So we get finally to the second inaugural, and in 701 words, we have God mentioned 14 times, the Bible quoted four times, prayer invoked three times. I wondered if there was a faith story in Grant. I hadn't read it in the traditional biographies. There is. It's a Methodist faith story. Grant, Julia's grandfather was a Methodist minister. I think Grant's mother was an incredible force upon him. When he asked John Rawlins of Galena to be his uh, chief aide, uh, I think his Methodism kicked in. Grant would never swear. He could not swear. He would say, by jingo, by jumbo. He'd say, Rollins does my swearing for me. <laughs> and then, again, absent from the biographies is that Methodism had become, by then, the middle of the 19th century, the largest Protestant denomination. And long before the Washington Cathedral was built, the Methodists built a national church. And they were so excited that the son of Methodism was going to be inaugurated president in 1869 that they inaugurated that church four days before Grant was inaugurated. Grant was a member of the Board of Trustees. His wife was in charge of paying off that uh, debt for the church. I had to cut a lot of pages out of my biography. I wrote too much. And, and one of the ones I had to cut out, I felt badly about it, was that Grant, at the beginning of his second term, wrote to every member of his cabinet and said, I think we ought to dedicate ourselves by meeting at my church, the Metropolitan Methodist Church, on Sunday. You'll like my preacher. He is a great preacher. And we will dedicate ourselves together with prayer as we start the second term. So this is the puzzle. Interesting questions. Not all of them easily answered. 
This evening, I'd like to share three episodes with you that I think lift up Grant's character and his leadership. The prologue introduces Grant coming to Washington. Lincoln gives him command of all the Union armies. Lincoln's habit was to meet his Union generals, either to travel to where they were or to ask them to come to the White House. He'd never met Grant, but he knew Grant was a Western man, as he was a Western man. Not pretentious, not a complainer, not asking for more than he could. Very, uh, very deferential towards leadership. So Grant, American armies don't march in the winter. That's why the British were so surprised when Washington crossed the Delaware at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. So in early May, Grant starts out in command of the Union Army. And yet George Meade, who had won the Battle of Gettysburg, but Lincoln was so angry with him because he allowed Robert E. Lee to escape back into Virginia. Meade is leading the major Eastern Army, the Army of the Potomac. Well, Lincoln had given him command, but the soldiers hadn't given him command. He was a Western general. He would have to prove himself. So they start across, they start down from Washington and they cross, cross the Rapidan River into Virginia. The Army, the Army of the Potomac, knew that four times before a Union Army had crossed into Virginia and four times before they had retreated in humiliation, beaten by the Confederates, lately the Army of Northern Virginia, led by Robert E. Lee. They approached this place called the Wilderness. My conviction in writing a biography and being an historian is you have to go to these places. I, I must say, Alan and others, I, I'm concerned with people who think they can do history sitting in their offices and writing from online sources. I'm happy that everything is digitized. You have to go there. The Grant papers are 32 volumes, but they're only 20% of what are in the Grant archives. You have to go to the Grant archives. You have to come here to the Lincoln archives. The Lincoln papers are wonderful. You have to come here. So I came to the wilderness under the tutelage of Gary Gallagher of the University of Virginia, one of our great Civil War historians, and I walked the wilderness. Well, when Grant arrived, he had an army of 120,000 men. Lee had an army of only 55,000 men, but Grant discovered something quite quickly. Artillery was useless in this forest. Scrub oak, five feet tall, so densely compacted that the sun could barely penetrate in the middle of the day. Horses and artillery were of no effect. They didn't use the term, but they could have that first several days of friendly fire. As men fell out of position, they started shooting and sometimes killed each other. And then within several hours, the real terror of nature took over. The forest caught fire and men began to burn to death, or they would shoot themselves before they could be burned to death. So at the end of two days, Grant is in his camp. He suffered 18,000 casualties in two days. Those of you who have seen the movie Lincoln know that Lincoln spent a great deal of time in the telegraph office, but the Confederates had cut the telegraph lines. So Lincoln was perplexed, what in the world is going on? At the end of that second day, a general arrives in Grant's camp, and he says, I know Lee's methods well by past experience. He will throw his whole army between us and the Rapidan and cut us off completely from our communications. Grant, a quiet man, sitting there listening to this, suddenly rose and said, oh, I am heartily tired of hearing about what Lee is going to do. Some of you seem to think he's going to suddenly turn a double somersault and land in our rear on both of our flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think what we are going to do ourselves instead of what Lee is going to do. Well, just about that moment, one of the senior war correspondents said, I'll give $1,000 $1, to anyone who's willing to go through the lines of the Confederates and get the word to Lincoln as to what is happening. Young Henry Wing, 24 years old, volunteered. He would try. It was a perilous challenge. But before he left, he walked over to Grant and asked, is there anything that you would want to say to President Lincoln? Grant, I'm sure, paused, thought about what he would say, and simply said this. Tell the president, quote, there will be no turning back. <laughs> 
there will be no turning back. So Wing started off, he got to the sentries of the Union side and they told him, you'll never get through, swallow the message, which he did, change your uniform, and when you get to the Confederate sentries, tell them Robert E. Lee has just won a great victory in the wilderness. Well, Wing somehow got through to Lincoln and he gave Lincoln the message and Lincoln turned to his young secretary, John Hay, and said, how near we have been to this thing before and failed. I believe if any other general had been at the head of this army, it would have been on the other side of the Rapidan. It is the dogged pertinacity, the dogged pertinacity of determination of Grant that wins. Well, the next morning, Grant gets up and pondering what he could do, tells me, I'm going to give an order that we're going to march all night, but I don't want the order given until 8 o'clock this evening. My, father, my wife's father came through Normandy on the fourth day. The soldier, the foot soldier in World War II doesn't really understand what's going on. These soldiers were somewhat bewildered and confused by what had happened. They didn't know what was going to be the strategy. Again, in the wilderness, there is this remarkable Orange Pike Road. You walk down that road and you come to a junction. And if you turn north, left, you will go back across the Rapidan or the Rappahannock back towards Washington. If you turn to the right, you will go south towards Richmond. So at 8 o'clock that evening, smoke coming from the fire, Grant starts down that Orange Pike Road, riding his huge high, 17 hands high Cincinnati, prancing in the darkness. And the soldiers understand that Grant is coming, the word is passed. And so we get to this momentous moment, and I'm so happy that someone was there with a pencil and paper <laughs> and describes this scene for posterity. Grant comes to this junction. The soldiers are all clustered around what will he do? And he turns south. He turns towards Richmond, and the soldiers begin to cheer, and they throw their hats in the air, and they start to sing. It's a singing army. Aren't we glad to get out of the wilderness? And Grant had now really won command of the Eastern Army. He'd won their trust. One of the privileges that's happened to me after uh, writing this book took me by surprise was that I'd heard that General David Petraeus was a great fan of Grant, very knowledgeable about him. So I asked the publisher to reach out to him, not really expecting anything, but he wrote back with a wonderful blurb and then wrote a letter and said, please give my greetings to my fellow Princetonian, Ron. Well, General Petraeus has a PhD from the Woodrow Wilson School of International Relations at Princeton University. And then he said, why don't we do some events together? So three weeks ago, we did an opening convocation at West Point together. And he told the cadets, there is no question, Ulysses S. Grant is the greatest American general. He said, you, gen you judge a general by three qualities. First, what he calls strategic, the whole, the whole strategy, which is both military and political, to understand the whole operation. Second is operational, where you're commanding, Grant was commanding five armies at the end, five armies together. And third is tactical, that particular battle for Mosul or whatever it might have been in the Civil War. Grant told the cadets, I mean, Petraeus told the cadets that uh, he read Grant in preparing for the surge in Iraq. He spoke to his generals in Iraq about Grant. He said it's Grant's determination that is the most enduring quality, the exact quality that Lincoln had said. Well, the second part of my effort to do this was I, I knew the story of the Civil War in a, in a way because I had to do this in the Lincoln biography, but once I entered into the uncharted territory of Grant's presidency, I confronted this whole question. How many people have told me in the last 11 months, well, I know that Grant was a great Civil War general, but it's too bad he was such a poor president. Was he really such a poor president? The scandals of his second administration six of them at least, have I think kind of taken over our whole understanding of the two terms. Just a few suggestions for you to consider. In the first inaugural address in March of 1869, Grant surprised his audience by saying early on, I think we need to deal with the Indian question. We have treated the Indians immorally in this country and we need to change our attitude. 
Like Lincoln, Grant would not campaign for the presidency. He traveled west during the summer of 1868, all the way out to Denver, and he came back with this understanding that the real problem in the west was not the Indians, it was the settlers. And now he's right against his closest friends, William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan, who believe mightily that the problem is the Indians. So in, within two weeks of starting his administration, he calls a group of people together to rethink the Indian question. And who would he call? He called the leaders of the Christian churches, all the Protestant churches and the Catholic church. He said, you have mission boards and mission, missionary agencies in your denominations. I think you could help us come up with a whole new person, persons who could be Indian agents, uncorruptible. It didn't all work out as well as it might. The Indian Wars came forward. The Army and many others were much against what Grant was doing. He was simply a do-gooder. He was naive about the real problem. This is quite something. But more remarkable than that is what happened with the efforts of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. You know the Lincoln movie is based around the 13th Amendment. Lincoln did not live to see the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. This was orchestrated by the Republican Party. Grant had been very deferential to leadership. I love his relationship with Lincoln. Lincoln early on came to trust him, so much so that in one conversation, Lincoln says to Grant, he says, now, I trust what you're going to do, but don't tell me. I can't keep secrets. <laughs> I can't keep secrets. So he said, you do what you don't, what you must do, but please don't tell me what you're going to do. <laughs> he trusted Grant. And uh, so Grant is very deferential. Unlike McClellan, who had established this very handsome headquarters in Washington, Grant very, very deliberately set up his headquarters outside of Washington. He didn't want to be influenced by Lincoln or Congress. Now Lincoln is assassinated and Andrew Johnson is president. And Grant tries mightily to become deferential as a military officer he believed should to Andrew Johnson. But he could not. He saw what Johnson was. And now Grant begins to become more politically astute. He begins to associate with Republicans in the House and in the Senate. He begins to learn more about this. But then he watches something take place that really surprises him. The very Republican Party that had initiated Reconstruction begins to withdraw, begins to with retreat from this policy. He doesn't understand it. And then what begins to happen is voter suppression. Do you know that in the year 2016, 14 states enacted restrictive voting laws that they had never put in place before? Well, the voter suppression of Lincoln's day was much more violent. It was the Ku Klux Klan and various white leaguers, often in league with the Democratic Party. Grant sets out to see if these forces can be stopped after riots in Memphis and New Orleans and other cities. But what he discovers is those who are the persecutors of African Americans are brought to trial and never convicted, never convicted. So he invokes the power of the federal government I think we often don't understand what really took place in the 19th century. Lincoln tells it best. I love his story or metaphor where he says these two men are wrestling each other. They're wrestling each other, and the more they wrestle, they wrestle out of each other's clothes into the clothes of the other. So in the 19th century, the Republican Party was the party of strong central government. The Democratic Party was the party of states' rights. In the 21st century, the Republican Party is the party of states' rights, and the Democratic Party is the party of strong federal government. So Grant, who, who endures criticism that he's a military dictator, says, I cannot allow this to happen. Did you know, I was so surprised, we think that Barack Obama was the first president to win a national election with a non-white majority. Not true. Ulysses S. Grant was the first person to win a national election in 1869. 1868 with a non-white majority. He only won the popular vote because 400,000 African Americans voted for him in 1868. Do you know how many African Americans were voting in the South by 1890? 3,000, 3,000. Grant saw what was happening and he committed himself to defending the freedmen. First of all, we have to get him elected. 
I, I love this uh, campaign. Uh, Grant and Colfax Tanners respectfully inform the people of the United States that they will be engaged in tanning old Democratic hides <laughs> until after the third day of November, 1868. The senior member of the firm, having considerable experience, his father was a tanner, in the business, thanks that by the help of his partner, all work will be done in a satisfactory manner. Look at the references. Three Confederate generals. <laughs> Simon Bolivar Buckner, General Robert E. Lee, and John Pemberton, who was at Vicksburg, and other distinguished persons of the same persuasion. What I found remarkable, too, was the story of Frederick Douglass, the greatest African American of the 19th century. Douglass admired Lincoln greatly, but he also had a little bit of an ambiguous relationship or attitude towards Lincoln, not so grand. Douglas campaigned for Grant in 1868. He campaigned for Grant in 1872. He was a strong proponent of Ulysses S. Grant. And in the epigraph at the beginning of my book, I have a wonderful quotation from Frederick Douglass of his estimation of Ulysses S. Grant. But here is what's really going on. Thomas Nast became the uh, father of what we call the political cartoon. He became a great friend and proponent of Grant. And I think this cartoon says it all. Here is what's happened. It's worse than slavery. Worse than slavery. Where a white leaguer and a Ku Klux Klaner shake hands over a African-American wife and husband who are cradling their dead or dying infant. This is what Grant confronted. And so he decided he would stand up for African Americans. Enduring much criticism, the liberal Republicans, so to speak, ran a, another candidate against him in 1872. They thought that this was not the way that the Republican Party should go. We should let this issue uh, to rest. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's move on to other issues that we ought to face more. At the beginning of his second term, a group of African Americans came to thank him in the White House. They were from Philadelphia. They said, you are the first president of the United States elected by the whole people. They wanted him to know that he represented, quote, the practical embodiment of our Republican theories. Grant responded, in your desire to obtain all the rights of citizens, I fully sympathize. I think this is a great descriptor of Grant. I sympathize. He spelled out what he meant. A ticket on a railroad or other conveyance should entitle you to all that it does other men. In this spirit, he told them, I wish that every voter of the United States should stand in all respects alike. It must come. It would be 90 years before it would come. Grant is the last American president before John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson and Martin Luther King and others who would make a change and bring true voting rights. Third episode becomes at the end of Grant's life. Again, I, I didn't know anything about this when I started into this story. Grant serves two terms as president, the only person elected to two consecutive terms between Abraham Lincoln and Woodrow Wilson. He's a great traveler. The travel for him was education. He sets off in 1877, having retired from the presidency on what he believes will be a private trip to Great Britain. He arrives in Liverpool and is surprised that the British people accept him as, as a hero. He doesn't think of himself in that way. He wears just common clothing, no medals on his chest. But the, wherever he goes, he receives this kind of reception. On July 4, 1878, he's in Hamburg, Germany, and the United States consul lifts a toast to Grant. He said, I want to toast the man who won the Civil War, the savior of our nation who won the Civil War. And Grant, who is not a good speaker, interrupts and says, sir, if I may, I did not win the Civil War. No, I, I didn't win the Civil War. The young men who came from their towns and their villages and farms, they won the Civil War. If you want to toast somebody, he said to that man, you toast those young men. Do not toast me. I did not win the Civil War. Is that the kind of leadership that America is best? He goes on to India, doesn't like the way the British treat the Indians. 
he gets to China and is so surprised that the leader of China says, we have this big dispute going on with Japan over five islands. Would you be willing to mediate this dispute? Grant literally becomes an ambassador. He gets to Japan and they said, we accept you as a mediator. We'd like for you to mediate our dispute between these two lands. Grant says in both China and Japan, do not let the Europeans into your country. <laughs> he said, you have your own values, your own culture. Do not let others tell you what to do. And I promise you, he said, the United States will never do that, will never interfere with your country. I learned again after I wrote the book, a Japanese person told me this, that early in the 20th century, years after Grant's death, a group of Japanese dignitaries, politicians, leaders came to New York City and their primary mission was to go to Grant's tomb and they brought flowers. Grant was a, is a great hero in Japan and they wanted, in like the year 1912, to offer their praise and commendation to Grant. Well, there were no presidential pensions in those years. It didn't come until Harry S. Truman. Grant couldn't live in Galena. He had to live in a big city, he thought, to earn a living, so he settled in New York. He tried various ventures. His son, Buck, his second son, got involved in a Wall Street firm, and Grant gave his son his money to invest. And on one terrible day in 1884, it was discovered that the partner of Buck was in a Ponzi scheme. He had no money. He was using their money. He had never put in his own money. He had a deal with the local banker. He would be imprisoned. And Grant came home to Julia with $81 to his name. That's all he had. He went that summer, they did, to their Long Branch, New Jersey summer home. And early in June, he bit into a peach and felt this terrible pain in his throat. His friend from Philadelphia, George Child, said, I have a visiting a friend who's a doctor here. And the doctor looked at the throat and said, well, when you get back to New York, you better see your doctor. Well, Grant's doctor was typically away in Europe for four months. He didn't see the doctor until October. The doctor did a biopsy. It was cancer. Grant had steadfastly told people he would never write his memoirs. He thought memoirs were self-serving. They were settling scores. Do you know how many memoirs were written during the eight years of Dwight David Eisenhower from his cabinet? One. Would you like to count how many memoirs were written during George W. Bush and Barack Obama <laughs> before they even left office? <laughs> Grant didn't like Sherman's memoirs. He felt it was too self-serving. But now the Century Magazine approached him. He didn't have any money and said, we'll pay you $10,000 to write your memoirs. That was a lot of money in the 19th century. But Mark Twain heard about it. Mark Twain called himself Grant intoxicated. <laughs> he loved Grant. And he rushed over to Grant's home in New York City and said later, he said, paying Grant $10,000 is what you'd pay an unknown Comanche to write his memoirs. And so he tried to persuade Grant that he would publish his memoirs. Now Grant's DNA was loyalty and he felt he'd kind of made a verbal commitment here to the Century Magazine, but his son and George Childs of Philadelphia's financial advisor persuaded him to withdraw that commitment. He never would sign a paper. And, they, and Mark Twain said, how much are they giving you, 10% royalty? I tell you what, I'll give you 70% of the net proceeds of this book, 70%. Grant set out to write his memoirs. First, we have to get him, I think, through a couple of, another, another cartoon. This is all, all the things on Grant's back as he tried to navigate being president. But here we see Grant, the, the great general now. It's not really cold, but he's put all this around him and he sets out to write his memoirs. Steadfastly, day by day by day, he writes his memoirs. But he's tiring, he's dying. So Mark Twain hires a stenographer who comes up from Washington so Grant can now dictate his memoirs. But by the beginning of 1885, Grant can no longer speak, so that doesn't work. I've been in the Library of Congress and looked at these little tiny slips of paper that Grant passed back and forth from his doctor. One struck me especially. Grant writes to his doctor, Dr. John Douglas, and he says, with every line I write, I know I'm driving another nail into my coffin. 
the word is out that Grant is dying. In fact, on March 30th, 1885, the, the New York Times says, Grant is sinking into the grave, sinking into the grave. On April 4, Mark Twain, who's in his home in Hartford, Connecticut, writes in his notebook, General Grant is still living this morning. Many a person between the two oceans lay hours awake last night, listening for the booming of the fire bells that should speak to the nation in simultaneous voice and tell of its calamity. He specified the bell strokes are to be 30 seconds apart, and there will be 63 the general's age. They will be striking in every town of the United States at the same moment. The affection, not just the admiration, the affection for Ulysses S. Grant. He finishes the memoirs three days before he dies. His funeral march in New York is much larger than Fort Lincoln. It's 1,500,000 people. 500,000 come into the city that day by train and by boat. And although the nation is coming apart, that nine-mile march is led by a remarkable symbol of unity and respect. For in the front carriage are the four greatest living generals, William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan of the Union and Simone Bolivar Buckner and Joseph Johnson, Robert E. Lee is no longer alive, of the Confederacy. They ride together in admiration and respect for this man they admired so much. So what am I saying? I think Grant is due for an upgrade. I, <laughs> I think we need to look at him again. And we need to see his whole life. Civil War general, American president, world leader who takes a 24-month world tour writer of the greatest memoir ever written. I had the privilege, as Alan alluded to at the outset, of being invited by President George W. Bush, along with Richard Norton Smith, to come to his ranch in Crawford, Texas, as President Bush was starting to write his memoirs. And he wanted to hear from us about other presidential memoirs. And certainly, we talked about Grant and what was so unique and distinctive about this memoir. So it's a great privilege to be here this evening to share this with you, and thank you very much, and we'll have comments and questions. And we have a microphone, because this is being recorded, so we'd like you to speak into the microphone. If you put your hand up, and We'll come and find you. Thank you. And thank you, sir, for being here tonight and sharing with us. Um, I have a question, and it's probably obvious. A lot of people, when you, when you read or hear about Ulysses S. Grant, um, People say that he was a butcher or a drunk. Um, how do you, I, I don't see alcoholism playing a part in, in Grant, in his life. So how do, how do you reconcile that with what you found and what, what is? Yes, the caricature or the portrait of Grant is that he's both, as the gentleman says, a butcher and a drunk. Well, for probably 40 years now, starting with James McPherson, our finest Civil War historian, we have taken a fresh look at what does this mean to be a butcher? And we've now looked at the casualties and compared Grant to Robert E. Lee. Granted that they were operating with much different size armies, and that just does not hold. But like many truths that are a part of the historical academic profession, it doesn't quite seep into the popular consciousness. So Grant the Butcher, and it's also part of, I didn't really answer the question at the outset of what we call the lost cause. Immediately after the Civil War, Confederate generals and newspaper editors in the South began to propagate what they called the lost cause. And the cause was the South, and the only reason they lost was that they were overwhelmed by the numerical superiority of the Union Army and by the industrial might of the North. This is the whole story of Gone with the Wind, 
and buy that butcher grant. <laughs> and so that is one reason that Grant's reputation began to fall. The drunk issue, the alcohol issue, is, is more complex, and I sought to find different voices who argued both sides of this. I think it cannot be denied that Grant did drink. I do not think he was an alcoholic or a drunk. I think it's also true that when he was alone, uh, he would fall perhaps into this. But when he was with Julia, he did not. And so what surprised me was in this very tumultuous war, he wanted Julia with him. And she was with him a lot. The people of Philadelphia gave the Grants a beautiful, beautiful home. And he expected that she would live in that home. Their children were going to school in Burlington, New Jersey. And she said, no, I want to be with you. And so she was at City Point, if you've been there, this tiny, tiny little cottage where the two of them lived as he was the commander of the Union Army. Both of these are, are topics that need to be looked at thoughtfully. I'm reading a book by, I think his name is Sheehan, and he's right, it's about, it's, he's an Englishman, and it's the uh, American Civil War. Mm -hmm. And today just happened to be one huge section about him. But a big piece of that, and I wish you'd share with everybody here, what his terms were at Appomattox and yes. how fair he was. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. Thank you. But what, what were the terms at Appomattox, in, in your words, how fair he was? Uh, early, uh, several weeks before, Grant had received word through Secretary of War Stanton that Lincoln held within his hands the way this war would end. But then the war ended rather quickly. So Grant arrives <laughs> kind of in muddy boots, and Lee arrives with his best dress uniform, and they start talking, and Lee says, don't you think we ought to get on with this? And so Grant simply sits down with his yellow pad and begins writing the terms. And as Grant reminds him of the status of the Confederate officers for whom the Confederacy did not own the horses of these soldiers, the soldiers owned their own horses. And so Grant writes out these terms where the soldiers can take their horses and take their firearms and return to their farms. It's springtime, so they can put in their crops and make a living. Initially, after the war, the victory was announced, the Union troops begin to cheer, and Grant sends out an order, you will cease and desist. Those who were who once are getting his lack are now our brothers again. So this is the reason that Grant had such respect from many of the sort of sons of Confederacy in the South in those years. And, and then when Andrew Johnson wanted to prosecute Lee, Grant said, you will not. This man is not a traitor. He said, he is the spiritual leader of the South. I thought that was an amazing phrase. And the way we treat Robert E. Lee will be the way I hope the South will respond. So, and then Longstreet, uh, Grant's friend, comes who had stood up with him at his wedding. He comes north and Grant gives him a, a pardon. And so this is a big part of Grant's legacy. Thank you. think about this movement to take down statues of... <laughs> well, let's really see. Do we have a half an hour here? <laughs> what, what do I think about the movement to take down the statues? Well, I wanted, first of all, to say what I just said, and that is the way Grant understood who these people were. They were not traitors to him. They were doing what they thought was best, and they were defending their state. Lincoln, you may know famously, changed our terminology. It used to be the United States are. This was really a kind of a state rights thing. But it became United States is. The Union became the centerpiece of this. The statues were put up at different times, first in cemeteries uh, by the, the Daughters of the Confederacy to honor those who had fought. It was like the greatest generation of was dying. And they wanted to remember these men who had been there fathers or grandfathers and went to member them. And yet, and so how to, how, how to, how to get people, especially young people, to, to understand people in their own historic context is really difficult. Uh, 
even the most avid abolitionist was never advocating for social equality in the 19th century. That was just not part of their thinking. And yet, on the other hand, we have to understand that there, the issue of slavery is there. And where is the place for those monuments? I, I'm, I'm starting in on a new biography project. It's called, it's on uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And Chamberlain is a professor and then President Bowdoin. In 1858, Jefferson Davis received an honorary degree from Bowdoin College. So Bowdoin College has been just struggling with what to do with that plaque. They made the decision to take the plaque from where it is and place it inside a museum or an archive, but not put it in a prominent place. These are difficult decisions. But we need to, I think, respond thoughtfully and not violently. Here's one. Thank you for your help. Yes. Yeah. She's getting a lot of exercise. <laughs> There you go. Right here. Um, Lincoln and Grant, as you say, I, I am sure did respect one another, but I don't think we can say that about Julia and Mary. Uh, uh, yes. Can you comment right. on that, please? Right. Yes. Uh, we, the comment is about <laughs> Julia and Mary. When, when, uh, when uh, Abraham and Mary visited City Point, uh, there was... Actually, first of all, a, a very young, attractive woman who was the wife of one of the generals, and uh, suddenly she sort of sidled up beside Abraham Lincoln and of course, and that just infuriated Mary. And Julia tried to intervene, tried to kind of be a mediator in this thing, and Mary would have none of it. And she sort of said, I know that you want to have a place in the White House, and took her on, you know. So the ultimate question becomes later on, why didn't the Grants not attend Ford's Theater on that awful night? And it's a tough question to answer. Some people have suggested that Julia had, had enough of Mary and she didn't want any more of it. I think probably the more accurate comment and question is that there had been someone she thought who was stalking her, stalking her at lunch, stalking her in a carriage that frightened her. And then she wrote to Ulysses, who was ready, ready to attend that evening, and said, I think it's time to leave Washington. I think it's time to visit our children who we haven't seen for a long time. What's remarkable about Julia later on, really surprised me, is that after Ulysses' death, she's vacationing one day in a wonderful resort in the Hudson River. And she learns that there's another widow vacationing there. It's Marina Davis. Jefferson Davis is wife. And she goes over and knocks on the door and introduces herself. And they become friends. And they are seen driving together in a carriage in New York City streets. Julia Grant and Verena Davis. She actually she actuated her own reconciliation after both husbands were gone. Yeah. Here's over here. Okay. When uh, Julia and Ulysses were married, did they take the slaves? Uh, good question. When Julia and Ulysses were, did they take the slaves? Uh, yes, she, she, the four slaves were sort of her household slaves, and she had them. She, she always called them her servants. She would never use the term slave. And then if you get to go to the U.S. Grant historic site, and I really commend it to you, I think it's really well done, they have a new movie, and it begins with this dramatic story that actually father-in-law Dent had given Ulysses one male slave to work on the farm. His name was William, strong young man, maybe in his early 30s. And in 1859, this is the way the movie begins, Grant, really hard up financially, decides to set this man free. Typically of Grant, he never tells us why. That slave would have brought him $1,000, at least a lot of money in the 19th century. But he goes into St. Louis and he signs the manumission papers and he sets this man free. It's like, I think, he can no longer abide this relationship. He's got to give it up, even though it hurts him financially as a farmer not to have this person helping him do this kind of physical labor. Thank you very much.